Hello, uh, good morning. My name is Anne de Geest. Um, I have been doing a weekly update on the COVID, uh, relying on very uh, great sources I have access to because I've been working in healthcare for the last 35 years. And my friends have been asking me to videotape those weekly updates and load it on YouTube so they can share with their friends. So this is the update that I did on Friday, May the 29th. And I'm going to screen my share so I can share a little bit about my background and, and start the presentation. Here we go. Um, so my background very quickly there is that I've been working in the healthcare space for the last 35 years, uh, initially as an executive, then as an entrepreneur, uh, angel investors and uh, uh, mentor capitalists and corporate advisors. In the process of that, I was involved in launching pulse oximetry for a company called Nelcor. Uh, which is uh, which is not part of Medtronic, and and as you know, that's the kind of the key vital sign that's being used nowadays to monitor COVID. Also, been involved in companies like VZQ that's doing the first telehealth for monitoring patients in the ICU, um, and I think they're monitoring around 15 to 20 percent of ICU patients in this country right now. And then Pixis and Army Cells for managing drug and supplies in hospitals and respiratory motion, which is another one to do ventilation, and and. I'm sharing this because I have deep background in the healthcare space and also have a lot of contacts and that's kind of the reliable source I'm using today to share, you know, you know, a quickly update of what I see is going on. So if you look what's going on, um, you can see on the graphic on the right that Europe is clearly on the decline and we'll talk a bit more about that. But what's really concerning that we've been talking with the group for the last several weeks is that South America is becoming the new hotspot. And also a bit worrisome is the rise of Africa. And so today I'm going to be talking about the virus, looking at the worldwide spread of the virus, what's happening in the U.S. and in particular California, which is where we are. Uh, we'll also talk about the new uh, discovery we've made about the virus, how it's progressing. Uh, some of the latest news on diagnostic vaccines and what we're seeing about the reopening of America. Uh, at a high level, I think it's really important that we're going to see that the vaccine is not going to come in the short term. And so therefore, change of behavior uh, is going to be critical. And this is what most of the world health experts are saying, is that we have to develop a system of testing, contract tracing, and isolation to control the virus, but also to make sure it doesn't reemerge uh, next winter. So we'll talk more about this and some of the data. Um, so uh, John Hopkins is kind of the gold standard to keep track of what is happening right now with the virus. As of Friday, we had 5.8 million people around the world in 188 country. Uh, it's pretty much except for Antarctica everywhere. Uh, unfortunately, Brazil now is number two in the world, just behind the US. And, and yet we're gonna talk more about the hotspots moving from the Northern hemisphere to the Southern hemisphere. You can see in the lower right corner there that on a worldwide basis, there, it's still rising in a number of new daily cases there. So on a worldwide basis, you know, we're still in the middle of the pandemic. And you can see the spread uh, of the daily reported death, which is kind of a hard measurement, uh, that you can see that Europe, which was really hit really badly like a couple of months ago, is clearly uh, on the mend. Uh, unfortunately, Latin America is growing and the US, North America, mostly there, is slowly going down, but not at a very high pace. And whenever I could, I've put the reference to some of these slides uh, so you can you know, play with it. Um, if you look on the normalized basis, it's really important when you look at numbers that you lose normalized data. So in these cases, it's the number of cases per million. So you don't have a, a distortion because of the size of the population. You can see that the US is clearly in a plateau. Uh, so that's the risk we're having reopening too early. We'll talk more about that. Brazil is on the upswing, unfortunately growing even faster than the US. Um, and then India is also coming up. And so one of the worry, uh, you, we start to see some of these large con uh, uh, countries with big populations there, we're unfortunately having an uptick. So this is a very interesting uh, heat map that JP Morgan has put together. And what it shows in red is the infection rate that's rising and in, in green, uh, in, in the range of the colors there, the fact that the infection rate is below the 25% of the peak. And what you want to see is what's going on with Europe, which is the, the growth phase is over and they're clearly in a deep recovery where even having ser several areas in Europe where now there's been no infection rate or very low cases. Uh, you can see in the US, we have some improvement there, but we still have a lot of hotspots. 
And then the bad news is Central America and South America were deep into the red and unfortunately Africa. So we need to keep an eye on this because what we don't want is like the traditional flu that it moves from the Northern hemisphere during our summer to the Southern hemisphere and then come back at the next winter. So if you look at the overall worldwide daily cases, you can see still on the uprise with Brazil leading, leading the charge. Uh, this is a very interesting graphic that shows the age of mortality. And, and in Italy, they had a very high mortality for the elderly. And so have we seen a lot of the European countries. We're starting to see in Europe, we'll talk more about this, that you know, there's a higher mortality between the age of 20 to 50 years old. But in some of these less developed countries, the mortality rate, the average medium mortality rate is very younger. And, and for example, in Brazil, 15% of the deaths are for people less than 50 years old. And in Mexico, 25% of the deaths are people between 25 and 49 years old. So uh, the explanation could be higher population density in large cities, a lot of poverty, um, and, you know, having difficulty accessing to care. Uh, lots of comorbidity like diabetes and obesity is the leading cause of, of high mortality rate as well as hypertension. So if we look at the last seven days, and so it's kind of a nice averaging there or where are the cases rising, you can see the hot spot is the US, but Brazil in the last several weeks has gone from a light yellow to dark brown. And, and then Russia is, is kind of also leading the charge. And unfortunately, India now is also, you know, increasing its rise. So we need to keep an eye on that for this large population. And Africa that was pretty much on the light yellow now is starting to, to basically rise. So South America is the new hot spot. Uh, and you can see that if you do again on a normalized basis, which is the number of cases per million, and if we do a three day rolling average, uh, so you kind of uh, smooth the curve a little bit, you can clearly see that this is the US rate. Um, and you can see Brazil, Peru, and Chile are clearly on an exponential upward curve. And unfortunately, Mexico is now starting to also emerge as a potential hotspot. So if we look at the daily confirmed cases per million, uh, you can see that now Brazil has passed the US in the mortality rate. And it is also expected that India, based on some world experts, based on the trajectory, could surpass uh, Russia uh, in the mortality rate in the coming weeks. So, so that's really bad news because that means the virus now is moving south. So uh, if you look on an ongoing basis there, Belgium has the highest mortality rate. We'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, is this because they're doing a better job at tracking uh, mortality rate? Uh, and, or is it because they have a mutation? And, and you can see countries like Iceland and South Korea were able to control the virus with a very low mortality rate. Um, and other countries you know, who had different approaches uh, like the United Kingdom, who delayed quite a bit. You can see the United Kingdom did not initially did a lockdown, and then they did it, and then they start having the, the slowing down of the curve. And Brazil, as you know, has decided not to have any uh, lockdown. So traveling the world, you can see the steep curve of Brazil and India and Peru and Chile and Mexico. And then, unfortunately, some of the high population, high density country like Pakistan and Bangladesh, uh, also on the upside, as well as Indonesia. Uh, where the cases are decreasing, you can see most of the European countries, UK, Spain, Italy, Germany, France, even Belgium, that was hit really hard there, and, and the Netherlands are all pretty much going back, not close to normal there, but clearly at the bottom of the curve. So these are all good news there. Uh, unfortunately, the US is pretty much you know, in a small plateau. We'll talk more about the fact that if you remove New York, it is a flat plateau. And so, so we have to keep an eye on this. Uh, in the growth basis there, you know, number of cases there, if you look at week by week, which is kind of, again, smoothing the curve a bit more. Unfortunately, that's the bad news. Africa is really on a week to week basis. They're accelerating. So we need to keep an eye on that. So mortality per million, uh, Belgium has one of the highest mortality per million of 810 uh, people per million there compared to the US. And then Europe is like in the middle there on four to 500 per million. And, and the, big, the big debate right now is this, are they under, is the European countries underreporting? There's been a report, which I'll talk about next week, about the fact it could be underreported by 1.5x. So if you have 100 cases, there's 50 cases of people who die who are not, who are above the normal curve at this time of the year. And, um, and so, so we need to, we will study this more next week. 
So let's talk about the US. Unfortunately, this is the 100,000 death week. Uh, it is very sad, these are real people. Uh, we had 1.7 million cases there. Um, let's do, take a bit of a deeper dive. This is something really interesting. Uh, we have 100,000 cases in California and 100,000 deaths in the US. And what you're seeing here compared to other part of the world is that we have a high mortality rate below the age of 65 if you compare this to Europe. For example, in Louisiana, Michigan, and New York City, 30% of the dead were for people below 65 years old. Um, and so uh, we need to understand better why. Uh, to get perspective, 100,000 is just a number, but this is now more people who die from the coronavirus in a period of three months in the US than the people who died over a period of two years in World War I. Since we're still on the upswing, and at the minimum, we're gonna double the mortality rate on the downside, and if we have a lower slope, which we'll talk about, uh, it could be more than that. We may be closer to some of the horrific numbers of World War II and, and the Civil War, but right now the estimates uh, is that we have hit 100,000, 100, and we, we could probably be at least at 240,000 uh, before the end of the year. So, but that's the perspective. It's more the Vietnam Wars, and the Korean Wars and the World War I. It's stunning in a very, very short period of time. So what's the latest news? 59% of the deaths are people over the age of 75. We roughly have around 900 deaths per day. 42% uh, are from nursing home. And that's an issue because some states don't report deaths from nursing homes. So we don't, you know, we, we don't have all the data. Uh, the black American population there has a higher mortality rate of 2.4x. And the Indian population is even 7x, significantly more. The majority, 41%, close to 41%, is from New York and New Jersey. Uh, the Columbia University came up with a model uh, that if we had done the lockdown two weeks earlier, we could have prevented 84% of the death, or even one week earlier. And so really the lockdown is the only thing that has worked if you look outside the US and Asia. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about the US. You can see the seven-day averages is on the on the downside, but if we remove New York, you can see the, the rest of the country as a whole is flat. We are in a plateau with a lot of the states still on the upswing, if you look on the right side. And unfortunately, these are the states that have reopened. So we'll have to see the next couple of weeks with real data and to see if there's an uptick, a flat, or it's slowly recovering. Um, now, this is very interesting. If you look at Europe as a whole, is, uh, and you look at the slope of the descent and we normalize the data by the number of people who had the cases per million. We do a three day trading average to so smooth the curve and we kind of normalize the curve to the same time on when it started on both sides. You can see that the US is not on the same slope of recovery than Europe. And what it means is that we'll have a higher mortality rate uh, on the down slope that, that what Europe is having there. Europe had a quick descent it seems to have peaked around 50 days and, and they have a nice you know, normalized curve where we're gonna get a slower curve. So why is that important? If you look, it's called the r now, and the r now is that for every person infected, how many other people do they infect? And in a pandemic situation like we have right now, the ratio is 2.5 if it's not controlled. Anything below one will stop the growth of the pandemic. Anything above one, it will basically accelerate the pandemic. A week ago, when we keep in track of this graphic, there was only two states. They were just barely above one. In the last week, we now have 11 states who basically have had a surge of the number of cases. And, and so we'll have to keep an eye because it takes roughly two weeks from the time somebody's contaminated to something that we can really measure uh, between the infection rate and mortality rate to see what's going to happen in the coming weeks as the rest of the country is opening up. You can see in the cases per million, clearly New York and New Jersey have controlled the curve. But then you can see California is an uptick. We'll talk a bit more about that. And uh, Puerto Rico and Texas and Maryland, you know. So uh, this is something that is a bit worrisome in the mortality rate. Where are the hot spots? It's the part of Los Angeles is really the problem area in, the, in San Francisco and some part of the Bay Area like Alameda and of course the whole Southeast. Uh, is where you see all the red colors is when there's few, uh, um, a higher amount of cases, you know, day to day, week to weeks. So New York is doing a fantastic job. I know they had some delay there without going to the controversy there, but they have really controlled the curve. 
uh, both on the number of new cases and mortality rate. Now, the rest of the country, unfortunately, California is still a bit of an upswing, and so is Virginia, North Carolina, Wisconsin. You can take a look here. Um, and some other states, you know, are, um, you know, doing a good job controlling. So it's a hot potch across the country. And from week to week, some of these states change from one category to the other. So if you look in a different way, you can see that there's a huge difference in the mortality rate between New York and California. Although we are at the number fifth in number of cases here, uh, if you look at the mortality, there were, you know, we are roughly 20, 20th. Uh, let me see, New York is 20 times more mortality rate per million than we, than we do have. We still are behind in the testing in California. We're not doing enough testing. New York has been much better at doing testing in their population. There's outbreaks, and uh, the good news is that a couple of weeks ago, we had a lot of deep dark red and deep blue colors there. So, so we, we have some growth, but it's not as bad as it was a couple of weeks ago. But if you look at the cities, these are no longer big urban density area. The virus is penetrating the Midwest and the South uh, in going to um, small to mid-sized uh, cities there, which may not be as prepared or may not have the healthcare uh, to support a, a surge. If you look at what they expect upcoming spot on the good news that you know we used to have a lot of very bad colors and now there's been a slowdown um, of the doubling of the cases so we went from red to yellow to green we have to see in the coming weeks if this comes back up but again if you look at the cities there these are not major cities there these are medium-sized cities california overall uh is doing a good job compared to our city on a normalized basis so this is the same rate uh, on an exponential curve uh, of mortality rate per million. Uh, and you can see most of the states, uh, the highest one, of course, was New York, New Jersey. There you can see in, in, in the gray zone that went peak way up there and is now kind of in the middle of the pack. I'm going to talk a little bit about California right now. Really the hot spot is uh, Southern California and we had some problem in, in Santa Clara and San Mateo. Um, this is the problem of California. On a daily basis there, it goes up and down. And if you smooth the curve on the 70 average, you can still see it's on the upswing with kind of the hot spot being Los Angeles. And so that's an area as Los Angeles is opening up and we're having some of these problems with riots and demonstration, you know, we have to keep an eye on that because we should expect a surge. Uh, it, it, this is another way to look at this. If you look at the number of positive cases, it's clearly the dominant hotspot of California both in cases and the heart number, which is patient in the ICU. Uh, if you look at the number of patients in the ICU, uh, which is where we had the high mortality rate in New York, it was as high as 88%. Uh, you can see we're on the down curve and really over the last two weeks, we've had that uptick, which is kind of tied to the increase that we see in Los Angeles. So we need to keep an eye on that. But most of the hospitals right now in Northern California, every open, they're doing elective surgeries, the ER are reopening. For a while, the ER was like at 30 to 50 percent of capacity. They were empty. People were so afraid to come. Uh, and I think we're trying to get back to a normalized basis. So let's talk about the virus. For people who haven't been there before, uh, we initially thought the virus was only attacking the lungs, and and we thought that there was this mucus that was created by the virus that was blocking the access of oxygen into the arterial blood and also blocking the extraction of the CO2. And we have what's called happy hypoxia, uh, which is people are showing up in the emergency room talking on their cell phone. And when they measure them, uh, pulse oximetry is the key measurement that people are using, which is a device that you put on your finger that monitor the percent of oxygen that's uh, being carried by hemoglobin, which are your heart, red cells. And normally it should be at 97% and uh, below 70%, you should be unconscious. And people are showing them in the ER with numbers between 50 to 70%, which we have never seen before. And so we don't fully understand why these patients are, don't have the problem of respiratory disease, which would just be that. It seems that the CO2 is still going through. And so these people have normal CO2 level and the CO2 is what drives your, your, your desire to breathe. It's not a lack of oxygen that gets you to take a deep breath. It's the fact that you have too much CO2 build up into your body there. And so what we have discovered in the last several weeks is unfortunately, not only is the virus attacking the lungs, which was the first acute symptoms we saw, but we now have discovered that the virus is going through the blood-brain barriers, uh, is attacking uh, nerves, 
and creating inflammatory response. Of, uh, and so one of the best uh, symptoms we'll see is the fact that you lose your sense of smell and taste because the nerve between your nose and your brain is being attacked by the virus. And that's why it takes several months to recover. We also are discovering that pretty much half the patients in the hospitals there have a normal level of liver enzyme. And so clearly it's attacking the liver. And now we're monitoring to see the long-term consequences of that. We have discovered in the last few weeks that it's attaching, it's attacking the ACE2 uh, connection there between the cells. And that is an issue there because it's what's in the lining of uh, the, the arterial and the venous uh, um, blood vessels. And as a result of that, it creates blood clots, we believe. You know, it's still something that we need to study more. And the problem with blood clots is that you see young people showing up in the emergency room with strokes and heart attacks, which doesn't make any sense for their age. And that's because they have these massive blood clots. And people, for example, end up on dialysis because the virus is also attacking the kidneys, have the filter all you know, clogged, uh, clogged uh, by the blood clots. We also have discovered because it's attaching to the ACE2 receptors that it's creating intestinal problems there. So the problem is that it, this thing is attacking pretty much all the vital organ in the body there. And, and this is a distribution of the type of symptoms we can see. It's very, very diverse, uh, which makes it hard at times to really identify the cause of which is why it took us a couple of months to try to get a feeling of how this virus works. So there's some interesting news that has come out recently there that there may be a relationship with the blood type. So if you have a group A, type A blood, uh, these, these cells are slightly bigger because of the way they are designed, you can see here, than they'd say the, the type O. And somehow the risk factors are two X differences. So the type A has a 1.5 higher risk factor versus that type O, which is 0.66. So that's something that we need to do more analysis to understand. But Chinese study uh, seems to indicate there's a relationship with the virus attacking the, 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 blood, the blood cells. The other thing we've discovered is that there is a human leukocytes antigen called HLI. And in the other family of the virus, not the COVID, but the earlier one, the SARS and the MERS, there was a relationship where people who had a mutation, or the allele here, had a much significantly worse outcome and a higher risk of being infected there. So the good news about this is that we can identify people at higher risk and take extra precaution for those subpopulation. This is really interesting data that came out two weeks ago from Los Alamos National Lab. I mean, the link is here, it's downloadable. And what it shows is that the virus has mutated. It started in China, and it's going to be the D version there. It's going to be an orange color. And then it mutated in Germany, and it pretty much took over the world. The other thing they've discovered is that there's a unique mutation to Belgium, which may explain, uh, but not proven yet, that it's linked to the higher mortality rate. So if you look at the Asian virus, which was this orange color here. And you can see that the mutation started in Germany and pretty much took over Italy and England and the Netherlands and New York. So uh, New York, you know, a lot of the virus came out of, came out of the European side, not the Chinese side. So this virus is, is really uh, maybe more contagious. We're still trying to understand it, but you can see how quickly in a period of really three to four weeks, we had this virus that really started uh, in Asia and, and basically took over uh, the mutation and, and spread all over the world. And for people who are into deep genomics, uh, the report shows the analysis of the virus and you can see this unique mutation. Now, ironically, in Belgium, they did a lockdown and the country basically blocked that mutation within Belgium. What will be interesting to see as they opening up in the coming weeks is that as they surrounded with countries around them with the Germanic mutation is to see, you know, where is the virus going to spread and will that affect mortality or, or infection rate? So we have to keep an eye on that. So how do we track the virus? The graphic on the right here is interesting. It looks at the number of people infected by sick precil. That's the R now we talk about it. Uh, anything above one, you know, it gets into a pandemic or very high contagious like chicken pox and measles. And then the fatality rate is a logarithmic scale on the left side. And you can see that unfortunately this virus has a perfect sweet spot. If it had too high contamination, it would basically run out of host by killing people too quickly. And if it was killing too many people like the bird flu, it quickly would basically uh, get himself out of the zone. So unfortunately, this is where the Spanish flu was so successful in the 1918 is that it, was, it has a, a, a mortality rate 
um, that was around three to five percent, and 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 it has a, the same type of contagious rate that we're seeing right now. So, so so that's the problem of that mixture of both. This is the sweet spot of this virus there. If you look about the time, uh, typically what happens when you get uh, exposed uh, within two to five days, you see the first symptoms. Uh, we know there's an inflection point at seven to ten days where your uh, immune response uh, go out of control, basically go into overdrive. And then they do what's called a cytokine storm, where they basically over respond to the virus, which creates a lot of the problems that we talked about earlier uh, in the hospitalization process there. The first one be between what we call acute respiratory distress syndromes there, which is the blockage of the lungs and inability to transfer oxygen and CO2 for the, for the alveolar balls. And then unfortunately we have a huge mortality rate and we've talked in the last few weeks about the fact that with 88% mortality rate, what we discovered is ventilators don't really help you. Uh, they just buy you times. And what we discovered is that we may have been doing more damage using high flow ventilators. And now we have moved uh, into using low flow cannula and, and low flow to kind of help the body fight uh, the virus. Uh, but the ventilator is not, is not a treatment. It just buys you time. So, there's a lot of confusion in the data. And the reason why it's confusing is because people have different definition of how we define COVID. The one thing we know for sure that's unique to this virus is two thirds, and this was reported in Europe, two thirds of the patients there start as the first symptoms to losing their sense of smell and taste. So if you notice anything like that, that is a very, very high suspicious sign that you may have been exposed and you need to really observe and monitor yourself. Uh, there's a lot of cost, but when you start looking at what's called blue line, which is people tested positive versus people tested negative, you can see that the other symptoms are kind of all over the map. You know, a lot of people may have diarrhea, but they don't have the virus. Uh, people have shortness of breath, and you can see that's a small percentage. So the initial criteria, which were shortness of, of breath and temperature, we have discovered is not really that reliable as an indicator. And there's been a lot of people, like 30 to 50% of people asymptomatic with no temperature. So, uh, so that has made it different because different countries have different criteria. They could test or define the cases to be COVID until we have done the diagnostic CPR test. So latest information, can you catch the virus a second time? There has been some concern coming out of Asia where people were going to the hospitals, had two tested negative, got discharged, and then a month or two later, they test positive again. The University of College of London uh, has done a study showing that the higher coronavirus exposure, so not the COVID-19, but the SARS and the MERS, typically give a one-year immunity. So that's one fact that we know. We know that in the South Korea second positive set, they were able to identify that these were dead, like these are cells that were dead from the lungs. And what that means is that the test, the PCR test, which is the gold standard to monitor if you have been, if you have the virus, cannot distinguish between an infection active cell versus a dead cell. So they, they believe that these people still shedding dead virus from their lungs for a long period of time after they've been discharged, but they don't believe they're infectious. So we need more data on that. Um, there are some concerning data coming out when people have recovered, developed uh, long-term uh, symptoms like inflammations and chronic fatigue syndromes. We don't fully understand their, their delayed immune response that makes you at high risk of capturing other things. We're still learning a lot of this in the coming weeks and months. Could the coronavirus lie dormant in the body like some other type of viruses and reemerge when you're under stress? The majority of experts say that's not the case, so that's kind of good news. You cannot be exposed and then suddenly it comes up, you know, months or years later. And how long are people infectious for? This is still a, a, a bit of a question mark. We have this idea that if you're quarantined for 14 days, uh, you're safe. But we have found uh, in the nose and the throat up to four weeks after initial infection, some, some, uh, some virus. And remember, we cannot always distinguish between an active and a dead cell. Uh, we just can look at the the viral uh, DNA. Um, and so we need to develop some new type of test to really see if the virus is, is infectious. Um, and we have seen people who have um, symptoms that can last up to 28 days. So we, so the 14 days is not a hard number. You know, it's, 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 an, uh, it's an average number. 
So uh, contact tracing is really important. This is a, a study that was done in South Africa that showed there was one patient, P1, that went to the emergency room for like one hour, very short period of time, and was released from the emergency room. But in the process, he infected a nurse and the nurse infected another patient that was admitted. And that patient basically went to a ward and infect all the wards. So at the end of the story, you had one person who entered the ER for one hour, infected 135 hospital staff and killed 15 people. So it, that really tells you how quickly this virus can, can basically infect. What they find out is a lot of the surfaces and the equipment that's being used you know, became infected, so you really spread from wards to wards. Another interesting analysis, this was a, a medical ward contamination. We have one patient there in bed 12A, which was over here, and they saw the same thing that uh, a lot of people got contaminated, 70% of them were nurses as opposed to other patients. So it is a big problem that in the hospital setting, we had set up the hospitals to have a lot of the beds close to each other to make it easier to have a nursing ratio of you know, uh, uh, one nurse for a few patients there. And now we are gonna have to figure out how we're going to redesign these workflows. So uh, another uh, data just came out is a cruise from Antarctica where they were able to test every patient on the cruise. And what they find out is 59% of the patient tested positive on the PCR. And this is the stunning number. 81% of those positive patients were asymptomatic. So the problem with this disease, which is different than the measles, which is more contagious, is that when you have the measles, you know, <laughs> you have these red patches everywhere. Uh, with this symptom, with this virus, you could be asymptomatic and continue to contaminate and not being aware of it. So masks do work. Um, there's been a lot of data. We talked about this in the past, but this is an interesting one that just came out in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is a very respected journal, where they look at the tracelets and the droplets and how far they went. And we talked uh, last week that they could go up to 200 miles per hour if you're sneezing and coughing, which means they go way beyond the six feet. But what they showed that was interesting is that when they put a washcloth, so not an N95 level, but you know, just like a, a mask, they were able to stop the droplets to kind of spread out um, and contaminate. So that's really important there. Uh, so there's another uh, data that came out of JAMA, which is again, the Journal of American Medical Association, very respectable journal, and one of the top one in this country. And they have made some measurement that sneeze, when you sneeze, you have this five to 10 micron droplet there that can travel up to 23 to 27 feet. So don't assume that, that that six feet is a safe zone. If somebody's sniffing and, and sneezing and coughing, you really are not protected. Uh, this is an interesting study from Rockefeller University that just came out where they look at the survivor uh, of, of the virus and they look at the different antibody that we discussed in the past. There's three different antibodies. The most important one is the IgG that takes around 20 days before you start developing them from kind of exposure. But what they discovered is that after this patient got discharged from the hospital, so they measured it at 39 days, so you should be at the full peak of the IgG, that the majority of the patient did not have enough antibodies to be protective. And the, the key antibody, this different type, is the one that can neutralize an activity if you get re-exposed. And, and then a third of those uh, antibodies, they were even below the minimum detectable level from the existing test, which may imply this continues to be verified that a lot of these patients there have been exposed in such a way or the immune system responds in such a way that they don't have a high level of antibody to protect themselves. On the positive side, they also find out there's this elite responder, which is around one to 2% of the participant who have this huge amount of antibody. And so they are trying to do the analysis to identify, is there something in their response that we could target with a vaccine that could create this very high response and generation of antibodies. So lots of work there that needs to be done there. Unfortunately, we're leaving the virus as we're developing the science. Uh, on the positive side, you know, there are people uh, on the entrepreneurial side who are coming up with some really cool technology. This is a filter uh, that is using what's called electroceuticals, uh, which is to create an electrical current to basically disinfect your mask. And, uh, and this was developed for wind care uh, dressings and now they're trying to I take that technology there to develop them into a more protective mask. So that, that could be kind of a really nice thing. Uh, there's a lot of confusion on the data. 
And, and unfortunately, uh, the states and even the CDC are not helping. One of the biggest mistakes several of these people did is that they combined the diagnostic test results from the PCR, which just measure your viral um, uh, load exposure there. So you have uh, a DNA that shows you have that COVID-19 virus, or do you measure the antibody, which is how your body responded to have been exposed, which typically takes a couple of weeks. And what the states have done is that they combine these two numbers, and it's really comparing our, uh, apples and oranges there. And so, uh, and even in the District of Columbia, they exclude the nursing home, and as we have seen, up to 40% of the mortality can be in nursing homes. So uh, it, it has been really, unfortunately, a lot of confusing data coming from states. Um, uh, there's this controversy in Florida about a health department official claiming that she has been pushed out because she refused to manipulate the state data. Uh, Harvard University took a very unusual uh, uh, step of rebuking the White House and HHS because they were quoting a report they did in a very misleading way uh, in the number of of cases, so, so it's unfortunately it's a bit of a mess. So how can we trust the data? And so there has been now some analysis showing if you take people who have been tested, which most of these people have been symptomatic, that's why they got tested. And then you compare that to a population where you test everybody, like in San Francisco, for example, they test thousands of people in the four blocks area there, and you look at the ratios. But the ratio, it could be you know significantly higher, so in New York, which had tested 1.9 prevalence in the population. If you look at the antibodies and all of the exposure of people who have not been tested, it's 15. So it's a really big ratio there. And you can see a 10x factor uh, in a lot of those countries there. So, uh, and so New York, uh, Geneva and Los Angeles, they did this population testing there in a small area there and they found a prevalence of around 4%. New York claims it's a prevalence of around 15% of people who have been exposed. So, uh, there's a lot of consp conspiracy theories, a lot of falsehood, even one saying that uh, Bill Gates was trying to basically put a tracker inside your body to, I don't know what. Uh, and so, so we have to really be careful where you get your source of information there. Uh, the World Health Organization saying there's an infodemic, which is an overabundance of information with a lot of false information there. Um, and, and unfortunately, what they show is that the false news travels faster than the real news. So please, you know, this is one of the reasons I'm doing this, is really I spend a lot of time looking at the data from uh, scientific journals to really try to get the, the, the real data. Um, so current testing, uh, these are all the links. The good news is that it's getting easier, not perfect, uh, to get access to be tested if you're concerned. Uh, there is a, a, a link here for people living in California. This is another link for people uh, living across the country there. There are still some issue in, in scaling up the scaling. Uh, the test that's being used in the White House called the Abbott ID now uh, has been uh, kind of recalled black box by the FDA because there's some accuracy issue. So the fast test may not be as accurate as the one that takes a bit more long, long time. There's a shortage of testing machine. Uh, and and so, so we're still kind of you know, trying to get the drug collectors, the reagents, the machines, you know, training people to use these machines. Uh, and, and what's really needed as we try to get into the antibodies, antibodies to see what's the prevalence in the population is that the existing test to do the antibody requires a blood collection. That means you need what's called a phlebotomist, which is a person that specialized in collecting the blood. So the good news, a lot of people are working in new ways of doing those tests using saliva and dry blood spot, uh, which will allow it to make it easier to get a kid at home and then you can return it by the mail. Hopefully that will come quickly there. Uh, there's some interesting uh, data looking at the prior family of the COVID uh, to see that in the past we had that exponential curve we've seen with that slow decay. But then what they noticed in the prior uh, coronavirus, uh, the SARS and the MERS, is that you had this blip there, uh, which is a resurgence. So we, we have to keep an eye uh, on making sure this doesn't happen to us. Uh, the good news, the the public uh, pharma companies, as well as the biotech industry has really stepped up. Everybody's working on this. Every week there's more vaccine and more treatment. Um, and um, there is a bit of a nationalist going on, which is really worrisome, where people are gonna use the access to the first vaccine as a political power. And you can really see, you know, US and China 
uh, already fighting with each other, uh, the Europeans trying to create a, a coordination uh, of activities there to do fundraising and to collaborate. The Bill Gates uh, Foundation there is really working very closely with the Europeans and trying to organize this and with Novari is there. So there's all these different efforts there. And as you know, uh, uh, the US has just uh, moved out of the World Health Organization uh, in the middle of the pandemic. So we'll see what that does to, to the US. So lots of different efforts, uh, not necessarily coordination. Unfortunately, that's because it's been used as a political power to get access to the vaccine for their population. So uh, this is interesting. It's a poll that wish just come out, which is only half of the population in the US is planning to take the vaccine. And the only way we're going to stop this pandemic is to develop uh, a herd immunity between 60 to 90% of the population. And so the only way we're going to get there is all people get exposed or they get vaccinated. So we need to keep an eye on why people are concerned, of course, safety of injecting your, injecting your body with a vaccine that hasn't been fully tested is a big issue there, especially as we try to speed it up. Uh, there was a hope a few weeks ago that we had discussed that the BCG vaccine, which was for tuberculosis, seemed to indicate that, that country like Russia in Africa and some of the emerging countries there were using the BCG vaccine and they had a lower number of cases. Unfortunately, as we have seen at the beginning, is that uh, there's been a massive rise in those countries there. So they don't believe that the correlation uh, is really working anymore. There is some hope that maybe we can use other type of vaccine like the one for polio or the MMR, which could boost the immune system because these are easy to make and they're low cost, but there is no data showing it will protect you against the virus. Uh, there's a lot of vaccine types here. I just want to show the different types very quickly there because there's multiple efforts. One is to take a live a virus and weaken it and re-injecting it and having an immune response. Another one is to take away the dangerous part of the virus vaccine, but you still have the shell, so the body still responds to that. Um, and then there's one where we try to synthesize uh, the vaccine so we can uh, basically get a response to it. And then there is this big effort, which is what most of them are right now, which is using DNA and RNA, and then fool the immune system to have a, to basically build the antibodies there. We have never built in volume a vaccine using DNA and RNA, but the good news is that uh, we're able to go faster in developing this. We, we have to see how we can manufacture them. So I'm, I'm saying this because there's a huge amount of effort uh, in there. Uh, it, the, the, the hope that it's going to be coming in this year is, I think, close to impossible. Uh, historically, it takes 16 to 20 years to get a vaccine now. We're trying to do it in 18 months. So uh, uh, so we'll see how that works. Uh, this is a list. Uh, you can go on, on this website there, but it keeps track on a weekly basis uh, of what type of vaccine, which group they are, what's, you know, it's an inactivated virus versus a DNA. And you can see most of them are preclinical and phase one, which is a long way to go all the way to phase three, which is the large uh, uh, demographics where you have to test this on thousands of people. Same thing for the antibodies, you can see this long list. So the good news is there's a massive amount of effort. The bad news is that we need time and we need to buy time. Um, and so treatment right now, therefore, is that we try to use antiviral. Um, the HIV antivirals have not worked out. And so we try everything that's antiviral to see if that could slow down the progression of the virus in patient hospitals there. We're using what's called convalescent plasma, which is to take the antibodies from people who have recovered and inject them in people who are really, really sick in the, in the ICU. Uh, it's not something that you can use for people who are mild, mild symptoms there. Uh, we're providing oxygen earlier using high flow candela instead of ventilator. And we're using anticoagulants because we have discovered there's all this blood clot and we start doing it earlier. And then we try to treat people uh, and detect them at home to identify who are these people at the days seven to 10 who are basically losing control of the cytokine storm. So uh, the jury is out. Uh, hydroxychloroquine does not work. Uh, there's been several data that seems to uh, confirm that. One is a very big study that published in April from the VA that's showing it has twice the mortality rate. It was a retrospective study. One that came out of the Lancet uh, recently there showed also increased the mortality rate. Since then, the drug has been banned in Italy, Belgium, and France. The World Health Organization has stopped all the clinical trials, and then New York and California doctors have stopped using it. So, uh, so please don't take that drug unless, unless you have medical supervision. Uh, the drug called Redemzivir from Gilead, uh, 
it's showing it helps, uh, but it only helps in the middle of the pack. In other words, if you're mild uh, symptoms to, to medium symptoms and you're being treated at home, it doesn't do anything. If you are in the hospitals, but you're not in the ICU on the ventilators, it does help and increase the recovery time by 47%. You can see that. Um, but if the people are on a ventilator, uh, it doesn't seem to be changing much. So it's helping, but it's not a cure for that. Um, uh, there's a lot of things on the therapeutic side, 426 drugs, so it, this number's is, is really increasing there. I won't spend too much time there, but I just want to reassure you there's a lot of efforts, but it takes time to get these drugs on the market, even if we cut a lot of the, the steps that we normally have to go through. Um, let's talk about the economy. This was an interesting uh, graphic that McKinsey published, and it shows that the sentiment uh, of uh, about is the economy going to recover? Right now, we have unemployment rate of 25%, which is the level of the Great Depression in the 30s. And the big question uh, that everybody's asking, which may create some of the response, uh, um, uh, is what are we going to do about this and how are people are going to respond to it? And you can see there are countries like Japan, where half the population is, is very pessimistic uh, and only 4% thinks that the whole thing is going to bounce back. Um, and then you can see the countries like India uh, who was just at the beginning of, of, of the virus, you know, are probably still very optimistic. China, who is on the recovery side, but we don't know about the data there, uh, you know, is positive, is, is optimistic. So, but overall, you know, every country is going to react differently there. There's no coordination there. The Bank of America had a forecast in yellow. They just revised it, expecting the worst economic recession that where they initially were planning to, and therefore a slow recovery. So it will take us several years to recover. And so as we're reopening the country, we're facing numbers we've never seen before, which is with 40 million people unemployed or 26% of the population. That is staggering. And we're gonna discuss that some of these businesses may never come back. And, and, so, and, and, and so that's a very big issue. Memorial Day weekend, as we all have seen in the news, is you don't see too many people with masks at six feet distance. So we'll have to see a couple of weeks after Memorial Day weekend, if there's a research and a flare up. Uh, this is a very interesting data, uh, which, which was public by JP Morgan, and it shows the relationship between the culture of the country and U.S. is of the most individualistic country, when people want to not to be told what to do, and and then collectivism, which is let's say communism or very strong socialism, like let's say Vietnam and China, where people do what they're being told to do, and then they correlate that to the number of infection per million on a normalized basis. And you clearly see it's not a perfect correlation there, but it's clearly something about the ability of certain country like South Korea and all of that to get their population to follow the mask in the distance and being locked up in, at home and all these other things there. And other countries, unfortunately, like us, who just don't want to do it. And you can look at the mortality rate and then the number of cases and, you know, not a pure correlation there, but it's clearly a some type of link there. So it's a good good discussion for your next cocktail Zoom meeting. Um, we're going to reopen the US, and uh, this is from a, an expert uh, that I talked to uh, in infection control. He says, time exposure is key. It turns out that the amount of time you get exposed to the virus is related to you being sick and the severity of your sickness. So if you meet somebody for five seconds, you know, with your dog walking in the street, there's a very low probability versus being in a room with somebody for two hours, shedding the virus. So that creates an issue in the work environment because we historically went to an office, we spent 10 together for eight hours, and we share space. And we share, you know, space that you can contaminate accidentally there that other people touch. So how do we clean those working space, uh, the entry and common area, the, the um, the elevators is a big problem because there's poor aeration in, vent in elevators. And suddenly this whole ventilation has to change. So people have to do some analysis on how we can change the flow to get, instead of bringing air in, is to basically uh, make sure we take the air out. So a lot of work in this area there, how can make the work environment safe? Uh, people in Asia now are trying to have uh, some app where they have to every day uh, respond some question about common symptoms and they cannot get into the workspace until they have entered this data. And that's, do you have a temperature, do you coughing and all these other signs like that. So, um, and they have to use masks. And 
And so, so we're going to have to figure out, you know, how do we identify people at high risk, treat them differently, allow them to work from home. Um, travel is going to be a big issue. How do we, how do we keep those places safe? Uh, hotel room are talking about leaving the room empty for 24 hours, fumigating it, uh, sealing it, using UV lights. Uh, they discovered this viral particle in the ventilation system. So how do we clean the ventilation system? So these are all things that people are trying to figure out as we speak. So we only come back and we're clearly reopening the country. And uh, we have to, uh, the economy has to come back. And you can see this is an interesting analysis again from JP Morgan that shows that ironically, when people lost their job, they start being entrepreneur. And that's the spirit of America. You can see the huge increase in the number of, of, of new business applications, same thing for mortgage. And you can see that the, the TCA checkpoint travel is the lowest number, not a surprise, people are still not flying there. So but we are slowly coming back to normal. Uh, the cell tracking from Apple is interesting. You can see that the US is coming back to normal while Europe is still you know, on, on partial lockdown. So we, we came back faster. They went much deeper in, in the lockdown. The San Francisco Bay Area, we're still in, in lockdown in that most of the counties here. So you can see that there's a big difference still um, far from being normal. Uh, the McKinsey did an interesting analysis showing what are the industries that are more at risk. And pretty much the retail service, food services industry is the one that may have a hard time recovering. Um, 30 million jobs uh, are at risk uh, with companies that have less than 500 employees. 50% of the job at firm with less than 100 employees are at risk. So, so these are massive numbers. If we have to restructure the economy and some of those type of services may not be able to adapt to an environment there where they have to provide uh, a different way of providing services like in the, in the restaurant industry and in the art and the sports industry, um, uh, it may have this long-term impact in the economy. Uh, California in particular, you know, we have a lot of tech jobs there. So most of the people affected there, you can see is the, the food and the customer service industry. So one third of the industry uh, of the workforce is at risk. Uh, some area of the countries are, are, you know, it's pretty much spread out across the country, unfortunately there. But we have to see how we respond as a country in helping those workers uh, finding new jobs or changing the way or paying more uh, for some of those services. Uh, this is my last slide, which is Zoom fatigue. So thank you for hanging there. Um, uh, if you wonder why you get fatigued doing being on Zoom all day long, well, there's some good reason for it. It turns out that our body has been trained uh, to look at clues, communication that are you know real time. And very often with Zoom, there's a delay. And you don't read the body language, you just see the head. Uh, in my case, you only see the slides. Uh, and there's a transmission delay based on the speed of your connectivity there. You then get distracted with all the chats. Uh, and then, uh, you know, it, it turns out that you see yourself. We have never seen ourselves when we speak. And at times it can be very distracting because you don't think you have the right side. Your nose is too big, your heart, your, your, your hair is too long. Uh, and then, you know, you deal with people of different sizes. And your brain is having a hard time to understand why you have people with different sizes uh, on the screen. And it turns out that when you are face to face with a person and within roughly two feet, you have a surge of EEG that can be measured. And then you release what's called neurotransmitters like the dopamine and the oxytocin. These are the, the, these are the neurotransmitters that makes you feel good. So it turns out when you speak to somebody face to face, you do feel good. It's just a chemical reaction of the brain. And uh, it doesn't look like it's working the same way with Zoom. And, and then the other problem, you may not know about this, but you may wonder when you're having a large Zoom, when there's like 20 people on the Zoom, you have a pecking order in how the grid shows up. And that turns out uh, that pecking order is based on the first one who signed in with a camera on, gets the first spot. If you turn it off, you go to the bathroom or you want to do something, you go to the bottom of the pile and you stay there. Um, so uh, if you think about politically, we all have learned when we go into a meeting room or where to sit is an art and you know who is there. We don't control this anymore. So there's gonna be a lot of what's called Zoom picking orders that people are gonna to try to figure out. So um, uh, so anyway, so this, this is my Q&A. We are going to stop the recording uh, to provide the privacy to my friends to ask questions. So thank you very much for the people on YouTube to be there and I hope to see you next week.